everybody. You're ready to have some fun? Okay. So today, I want to talk about our time. And I think you'll find this uh, conversation timely, considering what we've all been through over the last two years. And hopefully you walk away feeling inspired to do something different, to look for a certain demographic of people. But let's, let's start out with the basics. Um, when we take a look at the basics, um, we have our wellness pyramid. All right, so let me go back one slide here. Oh, interesting, they have my notes out of sync with my slides. So, <laughs> that's great. So remember our wellness pyramid that, that we anchor to when we're talking about health and wellness. Okay, we start with that foundational piece of eating right. And that means choosing whole foods over processed foods. That means um, being aware of the sugars that we're taking into our bodies and the simple carbohydrates. Um, that means taking our LLD daily to make up for those nutrients that we don't have in our foods anymore. It means making sure that we're eating nutrient-dense food, not caloric-dense food. We seem to have an imbalance in our country between caloric-dense food and nutrient-dense food. The second part of the pyramid is moving, right? Turns out these bodies were meant to move. They weren't meant to be stagnant. So we need to get our hearts pumping every day. We need to move our blood around every day. And it turns out that to build muscle, we have to strain our muscles. Kind of interesting how we were created that way. So if we want to build our body, we have to strain our body a little bit. So we have to be exercising. The third thing is kind of rest and maintain stress, to keep stress uh, under control. I know, and I know the slide is there, but as soon as I do that, guess what? My notes go completely away. So take your picture, it's okay. And then we can go back to my notes, okay? Good, everybody's cameras went up, that's great. And if we could maybe fix that, I don't know if we can on the notes, but. Um, so, let me go back to my notes here. So when we look at rest and maintaining stress, so that means we've got to sleep an appropriate amount of time every night. Now when we're young, that means about eight to 10 hours of sleep when we're in our teenage years. I know teenagers want to sleep like 12 to 14, but not good for them. Uh, and as we get older, it's somewhere between seven and eight hours of sleep. We need to make sure that we're doing that every night good rest of sleep. And then we want to make sure that we're maintaining our stress level, that we're making sure that our stress is under control. Our sympathetic nervous system is wonderful when we need it, but unfortunately in the world today, it's being far overtaxed, which affects our adrenals, and then all of a sudden we're constantly tired because we're just constantly under too much stress. So that means maintaining good boundaries and relationships. That means also making sure that we are um, having a good meditative practice, accessing that homeostasis in our thoughts. And then lastly is our reduced toxic load. Now you can do this through the abode line, you can do this through making sure that you're consuming good organically grown food, or better yet, grow the food yourself so that you know where it's coming from. Um, making sure that we're reducing the toxins that we can in our lives. That's really important. But on top of this foundation, which needs to be very, very solid, and the notes are good now, guys. I don't know what they did, but it's fixed now. Uh, we can look at the pillars of informed self-care. These might fit easily into one of these four categories. The first, our immunity pillar. Sometimes we have challenges with an immune system that's not working optimally. We may find seasonal threats challenging year after year after year, or, or that our immune system begins to fight against our own cells, which is a problem. So this pillar of informed self-care is where we might talk about those issues that affect our immune system. The next one would be mental health or mental wellness. This area is something that we're gonna talk about extensively today. But we may have feelings of anxiousness. We may feel down or not want to engage in our normal daily activities, and this pillar will address how our mind works and how we can best support it throughout our lives. Our next pillar is our metabolic health pillar. Sadly, this affects approximately 80% of the U.S. population, so it's fairly significant. 
And, and uh, we have Dr. Lisa Ma, who's going to be talking about that a little bit later today. So pay very close attention to what she has to talk about. Um, it's going to be fairly significant. But we look, in this pillar, we look at how our body metabolizes the nutrients that we give it, and how we manage the sugars that we consume, either from natural sources or from added sugars, which sadly is a huge part of our diet. And then lastly is our inflammatory response pillar. We want to make sure that we have a healthy inflammatory response. We all know that when we do not have homeostasis in this pillar, we actually have challenges when we wake up in the morning, we may ache in the morning, we may have symptoms in the evening after a long day, and sometimes we come by this genetically. And so um, making sure that we can have an appropriate healthy inflammatory response is important. But today, as I said, we're gonna land squarely in this pillar, okay? Our mental health pillar. I wanna start off with a story. This is my second oldest son, Parker, and Parker is my fly fishing buddy. So years ago, we decided to take a trip to Yellowstone National Park, and he and I were gonna go fly fishing for four days. And we packed up all our stuff to go camping up there, and we went up there, and this is a picture of Parker fly fishing. He's got that fly rod, he's floating it really well above his head. But you'll notice he's in ankle deep water, okay? So we spent all day fly fishing in the Yellowstone River. And while we saw beautiful scenery, we had a moose come down and drink uh, right across the river from us, which was just beautiful. We had a herd of bison on both sides of the river, which frankly made us a little nervous because um, they were right there. But we didn't get a single bite all day long. And the water was really low that year. There was a pretty significant drought going on. If you know anything about trout, they like cold water and they like deep water. They didn't have access to that. So while the trout were there, they were all stressed. They did not want to bite. And so it was a rather frustrating day for two fishermen as we got in the car and we drove back to our camp. And we were talking about how frustrated we were. A full day of fly fishing and hadn't caught a thing. And we came across this sign on the way home. Side of the road. And they said, rough break ahead. And it kind of switched the conversation for us. So we go, okay, so we've just had a rough break, right? So what are we going to do about that? Are we done? Are we just going to pack it up and go home? Are we going to go back and try to fish that same river tomorrow? Just push on? Or are we going to adapt? What we decided to do, is fishermen like to catch fish, and we hadn't caught a single one. We're like, well, let's change our perspective on this. What do you say we go whitewater kayaking down the Yellowstone River instead? So we found a section of the river that had great white water and we went kayaking for three days. We switched it up and we had a great time. Built a great relationship. We've had a rough break over the last two years, haven't we? Things have been hard. Things have been challenging, probably more challenging than they've ever been in our lives. So I want to talk a little bit about that now. Pandemic and mental health. <clears throat> the pandemic has created an environment <clears throat> where many determinants of men mental health have been impacted. Examples might include reduced social contact, loss of livelihood, reduced interaction with peers, economic loss, increased rates of domestic violence, decreased access to mental health uh, services. Even before the pandemic, Mental health service issues or mental health issues were the leading cause of disease burden in most countries with the mental health system not well equipped for that burden. And now we have an even higher burden. In fact, you can see that um, yeah, go back one more slide. The increase has been Fairly significant. Um, we've had an increase of 26 to 28 percent. That means that 50 to 76 more mil million more Americans are now affected with mental health concerns. And sadly, women are inordinately affected. Why is that? Because often when children are asked to stay home from school and be homeschooled, women carry that burden. Often when domestic violence rates go up, women carry that burden. Women have been affected significantly by this challenge. 
My slides are off again, guys. I don't know what happened, but the screen is not showing what that screen is showing. So you'll see that there is now an epidemic within the pandemic. Teenage children showing symptoms of worsening mental health has gone up by 46%. That's pretty significant. How many of us in here have teenagers? Seen a change with them over the last two years? What's interesting to me is that between the ages of 13 and 15, the normal development is that they are supposed to push away from parents and go to peers. That's normal development. We want them to do that. We want them to experience that. That's their way of kind of figuring out themselves and figuring out how to be independent adults. What have we done over the last two years is we've not allowed them to see their peers. We've pushed them into parents. So they haven't gone through that normal phase of development. I fear what's going to happen in the coming years having not gone through that normal phase of development where they become independent in a way. Social isolation has been particularly rough on teenagers. In the U.S., suicide is now the second leading cause of death for 15 to 19 year olds. And between March and October of 2020, the emergency room department visits for children with mental health issues rose 24% between the ages of 5 and 11. 31% for those between the ages of 12 and 17. Kids' social skills have suffered along with everything else during the long months of isolation, making even simple conversations feel awkward and working through conflicts more difficult. What I've noticed in my own family is that kids are no longer even able to make phone calls. They're afraid of talking with someone even on the phone. And that's scary. On top of that, our stress buckets are overflowing. A noted child psychologist at Boston Children's Hospital says, we only have so much cognitive capacity to manage things. And though many of us are trying to move on, there is this additional new normal stress manage. And anger is armor. For some people, it feels safer to show anger over sadness and worry, which some kids might call weak emotions or children are showing a lot of anger. Trauma has just built up, and it is coming out as aggression in our kids. Think about this trauma. More than 150,000 children in the U.S. have lost one or more caregivers in their home. It's pretty significant. And sadly, the leading experts believe that the worst is yet to come. The longer the trauma continues, the greater the impact. Decades of research document the serious long-term effects of chronic childhood stress. It can alter the structure of the brain and nervous system, which impacts learning, memory, decision-making, and more. Stress can also lead to lifelong health problems. Stress can cause the following feelings of anger, fear, sadness, worry, numbness, frustration, changes in appetite, energy, desires, and interests. Difficulty concentrating and making decisions, difficulty sleeping or nightmares, physical reactions such as headaches, body pains, stomach problems, and skin rashes, and then worsening of chronic health conditions, worsening of mental health conditions, and increased use of tobacco, alcohol, and other substances. As you can see, this is a serious problem affecting everyone from children all the way through adults. In our clinic, we're constantly seeing the effects of this, with children coming in crying, Teenagers coming in, not knowing what to do, and adults worrying about their children. It's pretty significant. Sadly, we've also seen some of the effects of domestic violence in our clinic. With some of the women coming in and us recognizing some of those signs and getting them some intervention. But experts believe that without intervention, we're likely to see the effects of the last two years for five or six more decades. 50 to 60 years more. So, resilience. Resilience is defined by Webster as the ability to recover quickly from difficulties, toughness, or the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape. In fact, I would argue that we are made to be resilient. We are made to go through tough things and come back stronger and better. Remember what I mentioned about muscles. Muscles do not grow without straining the muscle. 
have an opportunity to grow here. I would also like to mention this concept. In medicine, we talk about mental health, depression, and anxiety, and those are defined illnesses as defined by the DSM-5, which is a book that we refer to. If you meet certain criteria in this book, then you're diagnosed with a mental illness, and I would suggest seeking professional help in dealing with those complicated issues. But that is only the tip of the iceberg. As a matter of fact, most of us don't live above that waterline. Most of us live below the waterline. Most of us live in the messiness of life. We have days where we just don't want to get out of bed. We have days where we're anxious about things. We have days where we're worried about our kids. And that's us. That's most of us. So today we're going to talk about some things that may be able to help with that. When I talked about now is our time, I want to tell you about this generation here, called the greatest generation. We are seeing a world headed for disaster, much like they were in 1941. In 1941, we as a country made a decision that we were not willing to accept what the future held. So we decided that we would enter a war. The men would go to war and the women would go to work. And because of that, they changed the outcome of what likely was going to be a horrible disaster for our world. Years later, Ronald Reagan stood at the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. He'd written a, war, he'd written a speech, and his speechwriters had told him, do not give that speech. And he said, no, I will. And so he stood at the Brandenburg Gate, and he said these words, come here to this gate, Mr. Gorbachev. Open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall against everyone's advice. That statement and some orchestrated movements led to, two years later, the Berlin Wall Fall, allowing families to come together that have been separated for decades. And lastly, I want to show you this quick video. It's one of my favorite videos. I am not a Doctor Who fan. I will tell you that, but my kids showed me this video and I could not resist it. I do love Van Gogh. In this video, they call him Van Gogh because it was made in Europe. But, I am a huge fan of Van Gogh. I have studied his life for years. I love the man and what he did and what he brought to the world. But this is when Dr. Who brings Van Gogh into the future and shows him his life in retrospect. Where are we? Paris, 2010 AD. And this is the mighty Musée d'Orsay, home to many of the greatest paintings in history. Oh, that's wonderful. Ah, uh, ignore that, I've got something more important to show you. Take all your chances while you can Never know when they'll pass you by Like a sub-limitation say so, but I just wondered, between you and me, in a uh, hundred words, where do you think Van Gogh rates in the history of art? Well, uh, big question, uh, but to me, Van Gogh is the finest painter in the world. Certainly the most popular, great painter of all time. The most beloved, his command of color, the most magnificent. He transformed the pain of his tormented life into ecstatic beauty. Pain is easy to portray, but to 
to use your passion and pain to portray the ecstasy and joy and magnificence of our world. No one had ever done it before. Perhaps no one ever will again. But to my mind, that strange, wild man who roamed the fields of Provence was not only the world's greatest artist, but also one of the greatest men who ever lived. Vincent, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, is it too much? No. I've got tears of joy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Sorry about the beard. So, that being said, so what do we do? First, remember that taking care of yourself can better equip you to take care of others. Remember, most of us flew here, we were told on the plane, when the oxygen masks drop, what do you do? Put on yourself first. You have to take care of yourself. Now, I will say this, in my observation over the last 20 years, men, we do a pretty dang good job of that. <laughs> Pay attention. Ladies always have someone else at the top of their list, and rarely do. And we can learn something, okay? Sometimes other, other people should take the top of the list. Women, you can learn something. Take care of yourselves. If you're not there, you'll be significantly missed. Secondly, thank you, yes. Um, there's a reason that we're different, and we should recognize that and cherish that. Um, we also need to teach mindfulness. We need to teach ourselves how to breathe. We need to teach our children how to breathe. I have a daughter who's eight years old who loves to lead our family meditation. She gathered us together. She has a little singing bowl. She taps it. It's like, everybody sit down. <laughs> then she makes it sing. And then she has us close our eyes and she leads us in meditation. She loves that part, her role in the family to do that. But it's important that we allow our children to have that space to learn how to breathe, to learn how to access normalcy in their brainwaves so that when they get stressed, they can take a couple of breaths and access that again. Okay? We need to take care of our body. Sometimes when we get stressed, we throw the things out that were the best things for us to do. Rest, right? We'll find, well, I've just got to stay up till 2 a.m. to get these things done. No, you don't. You should be going to bed, right? We should be taking care of ourselves. We should be having a normal diet. Certainly, if we weren't turning to alcohol before, we should not be turning to alcohol now. Okay? It's not a great way to cope with things. Okay? We should be aware of our screen time. Remember, you never post your worst days, neither does anyone else. Be very careful of your screen time, and I would say particularly be careful of the news that you watch. If you are one of those people that must watch the news, choose one source and watch it once a day and I promise that's all you need, okay? Um, be very careful with that. Make sure that you find social interaction, connect with people. It's so very important over this last two years that we've been isolated, that we've lost that ability, particularly our children have lost that ability. So have friends over to your home. Help them socialize again. We used to breed German Shepherds. And one of the biggest things with German Shepherds and their health is to make sure they socialize with other dogs. Children are much the same way. If they stay isolated, they will be weird and not develop. <laughs> Socialize them with other children. And make sure that you have a routine. The last thing I will tell you about this is serve big. It turns out that when we serve others, we get the benefit. And not by them serving us, but we feel better. Our problems get into perspective when we serve other people. So find someone to serve. And then I want to go on to some products that can help support this, okay? PB Assist and PB Assist Junior. We probably wouldn't think about that with, in regards to mental health, 
But let me tell you, the research is ample. Eliza McCoe is going to talk a little bit about this later, so pay attention to her presentation. But our gut health is strongly associated with our mental health. It turns out that many of our neurotransmitters are made in our GI tract. So supporting our GI tract with PB Assist or PB Assist Junior, taking LLV daily, and having a diet full of fruits, vegetables, and whole foods is extremely helpful for our mental health. <coughs> Secondly, Lavender. Lavender is high in linalool and linalool acetate. Okay? It is very helpful in our brains and helping us calm down. These two compounds help us deal with our feelings of anxiousness and supporting a good night's sleep. But sometimes we find people that aren't so keen on the flowery smell of lavender. So what do you do? You go to your chemistry lessons and you think, oh, I know of some other oils that have linalool in them. Well, what about pedigree? Right, Dr. Hillis called that the man's lavender. Yeah. It's a spicy scent to it, like pepper. Little oil, a little acetate are in there. Or you can turn to bergamot, if someone likes the citrus oils. It also has those same compounds in them. Those can be used to help us just calm down. We often use those in our meditation in our home. Other products that we support is our adaptive line. It is an amazing line. <laughs> I find it interesting that it was formulated shortly before we went through a worldwide pandemic. Interesting. So when we need to be calm, we can, we can diffuse or apply the adaptive blend. We're seeing some very quick responses in our clinic with this. We have some of those emotional breakdowns. We'll grab our adaptive, apply it to the patient, help them breathe that in, and it really helps them. The adaptive capsules have been formulated not only with a great blend of oils like lavender, coriander, wild orange, and fennel, but it also has scalidium root and ahi flower in it. Now, the ahi flower is a great source of stereodonic acid, which the body converts to EPA. EPA is one of those omega-3 fatty acids that's been shown to be very, very helpful in our brain health. Um, it also has the scalidium root, which has been has great historical use with the uh, San and Koi Koi people. I just wanted to throw that in there because it's fun to say Koi Koi. But um, the Koi Koi people of South Africa, they've used this to elevate, um, elevate mood, increase endurance, impart clarity of thinking, uh, enhance decision making, and reduce the effects of stress, stress in their lives. And then of course, GABA, which is a naturally occurring amino acid. It also acts as a neurotransmitter by binding to the GABA receptor in the brain by doing so helps to reduce those feelings of anxiousness, stress, and fear. So adaptive is something that can be used acutely or on a long-term basis. And then lastly, a product we might not think of, which is Serenity. I love Serenity Complex. And let me tell you, I've looked at the research, the product in Europe that I refer to quite commonly with physicians, uh, that is 80 milligrams of lavender in a capsule that has extensive research behind it. As it turns out, L-theanine is 80 milligrams I'm sorry, uh, Serenity is 80 milligrams of lavender in a capsule. The research on that with what we're currently experiencing is really, really powerful. So that is something that I would recommend to patients taking twice daily. And lastly, I wanna make for a plug for a product that you might not think of also, okay? So this product has been studied extensively. It is by far the best product that doTERRA has. Side effect profile is really quite minimal. And um, so people tolerate this really, really well, okay? Uh, it is rather fantastic. That product is you. <laughs> the wellness apparatus. A human being caring for someone. So often the question is asked is, I'm a person. I'm just one person. What really can I do? Well, I want to end with one final story gentleman one day in some despair that drove to the parking lot of the Golden Gate Bridge, thinking that he was going to join the 1,700 plus others that have leapt from that bridge and ended their life. And he was in the middle of writing his suicide note to leave in the car, was writing the words, no one has ever shown me kindness. This world is a cruel, cruel place. As he was writing those words, there was a knock on his car window. And so, 
roll down the window, and there's a gentleman on his bicycle, and he says, hey, I've got two sodas here, and I'm only going to drink one of them. These are my favorite sodas. I love them. And I thought you might like them. So would you care to have my other soda? And this man awkwardly reaches through the window and says, sure. And the gentleman on the bike says, I hope you have a fantastic day. And he rides off. The gentleman in the car sat. And he cried and cried and cried until the well was empty. And he drank his soda and he drove home, never to return to that bridge again. One simple act of kindness, sharing a soda pop to a stranger and wishing him a good day. You each have that power to find someone that needs you and to intervene with a smile or a hug or a kind word and show them that you care about them. We have amazing products to help these people. There's no doubt about that, okay? But you're the delivery system. You're the person that has to go out and find those that need you. My recommendation to you is that every day, you look for the one. The one person that day that has been put into your path for you to affect, for you to show kindness to, for you to love on. Dr. Steve Morovi said this, with one kind gesture, you can change a life. One person at a time, you can change the world. One day at a time, we can change everything. Now is our time. Now is our time to step up and answer the call. Thank you.